Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast, which is kind of like a guest episode, kind of like a roundtable discussion. I don't know what it is, a partnership episode. Maybe that's what we should call it, Katie. <laughs> yes, I like that. We've been partners for what I feel like is a long time. Oh, my At least gosh. I viewed it as a partnership. It's been a while. Yes, definitely, definitely. We go way back. And it's so fun to have this opportunity for you and I to get to catch up, but also to talk about continuous glucose monitors that we both have been or have worn earlier this year. And before we get into all of that, could you just give a brief intro of who is Katie? What's what's your jam? Who do you serve? What's your passion right now? <laughs> all the good well, stuff. Currently, I'm serving myself. I'm really not yes. doing much in, <laughs> um, in, in, the, in the sales space right now. So um, I'm a mom of three and my passion comes in recipe development and food and all the experiences that really surround that and how food just makes things better and how, you know, you can enjoy life and, and weave food into it. And I just, so that's always been where, that's been the genesis of everything I've done. And I did for a time, uh, have some, um, macro coaching clients. I did sort of realize that that transitioned a little bit more into like lifestyle, a little bit more mindset. And when I felt like that sort of became out of my scope, I, I let it go and I dialed it back into recipes and that's sort of what brings me here right now is I'm still super nerdy and into the science of everything. And I want to gather all the data I always can. And I love like making myself my own N equals one experiment. But at the end of the day, I've realized that what works for me is not a copy and paste situation. So I've kind of stopped giving advice to other people because I'm just not equipped for it. There's so mm. many people like you who do it better than me. So I'm going to just step back and let that happen. No, I mean, that's powerful. Just what you just said of like people ask questions, which we'll definitely get into this in terms of blood sugar today. But oftentimes um, people ask questions because they want like a black and white answer. And that is nearly non-existent when it comes to nutrition and fitness and everyone's body. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, I've learned that. And I spend a lot of time absorbing and consuming content on Instagram because there's so much free content if you are somebody who wanted to change your body in any way. And I did it. And I was really disciplined and really good at following the rules. And so I saw some great results when I was focused on, on aesthetics. And uh, turns out that that really wasn't something that served me long term. That was just a season and it was short term. But it is something that's sort of immortalized on social media. And so people can see photographs or they saw would see stories and they'd say, okay, I want that physique is what I'm looking for. And so for whatever reason, suddenly I had enough credibility that you could ask me and I could give you the answers. And that just truly was never the case. Mm. Yeah. I mean, gosh, you and I have probably worked together in some way, shape or form for almost three years ish mm -hmm, now up until recently. Yeah. And I feel like our histories do share a lot of those similarities of like having those periods of time where you were just like, give me all the information, like talk to me about macros. Cause that's all I want to talk about. And yes, I train like a beast and you go mm -hmm. to those extremes and it can be really fun. And there also is a lot to learn there, but you and I both over the past year plus have, I feel like focused more on that. Like you, like how you answered my first question, like, how do I serve myself? How do I yes. actually take care of myself and my body in a way that just feels easy and feels good? Yeah. And that has been probably the hardest of all of the, the health and um, fitness lessons that I've had to ever learn was tuning in and figuring out what serves me. It, there's nothing that's been harder than that, probably because I've ignored mm -hmm. it for so long and I've turned the volume down on that piece for most of my life. And so to finally sit back and try to just not only, not, I mean, if it was just as easy as sitting with it, I probably would have figured it out a long time ago, but I had to learn how to sense it and find it and then just really source it. So it's an ongoing journey, but it's, it's one that's been a long time coming. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It's been so cool to see you grow through all of that. I mean, it's been incredible because I think a big part of that too is some dark days, right? Yeah. Like I know that's been the truth on my journey and those dark days are so hard, but you always come out of them. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's beautiful to see. Yeah. 
if there's one thing that's I, I found true about the darkness is that it's it's so cliche, but it's it absolutely leads to uh, just a rush of light and mm-hmm. and change and a shift of energy. And just when I think I can't do something anymore, that is when the universe just like supports me and just props me up. And it's like that that whole like you know leap in the ground will catch you or whatever that phrase is has really been true for me um, because there's been so many moments. Well, most when you were coaching me at the, and I'd say the last probably eight months that you and I were, were coaching together was when I was probably um, at, at, at the lowest points, but also had the biggest breakthroughs. And and I think they all sort of culminated, I think, early and earlier this year in April when, um, you know, I got my cycle back and I got COVID and I like all sorts of stuff just happened all at once. And it was like, Oh my God. I just felt like I finally had come up for air and I didn't even realize how hard it had been until I could like breathe a little bit again. So mm. yeah, darkness for sure, but it, le- it, com- it, it leads to the light. Yeah. And you've had a couple, you've written several recipe books and you had one come out very recently, right? Mm-hmm. And then, so that's like your main focus right now, but also you are a brilliant product reviewer. Which is leads us into what I wanted to talk about because I have, oh my gosh, for years I've wanted to experiment more with glucose monitoring. And there was a period, I think it was 2017 or 2018, where I was doing the finger pricks like every morning for a while, which only tells you you're fasted blood glucose, which we'll get into a little bit. But I don't know why it took me so long to like take the plunge to try out a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor. And it was really because of you. Cause you were like, I I'm working with this company. I'm going to try one. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do this with you. So how did that, how did that transpire? And what like motivated you to try a CGM? So, I mean, to be, to be fully transparent, a lot of companies throw a lot of opportunities at me for stuff that is usually crap. Um, or stuff that I I feel like there's just no way I would even consider reviewing something like that. Um, but when this one came into my inbox, I it was a hell yes because I I knew this was data that I had never been able to source before. And as much as I was trying to sort of get into my own body um, and continue to like trust my own intuition, there was there's still the scientist part of me that really wants to know like, okay, but what do the numbers say? And like, it's not enough to just track the macros, even though I hadn't been tracking macros for a really long time at that point. Um, so when they offered me the opportunity to try out their device, um, in exchange for my honest review, and that was part that was from the very beginning. I said, you know, I re- it's really important that I, I I review something after I've tried it for a certain amount of time. I don't just want to go out of the gates having really no information. And I had to go onto an onboarding call with them before anything even began to have the conversation that I from the beginning I have a little bit of trouble with all of the the, the weight loss dialogue surrounding CGMs because that's really how they're marketed. And that's really not how I'd like to go about this conversation with my audience because that's not what I'm using it for. And they were open to that. Um, With that in mind, they did want to approve everything I said on Instagram before I said it. Uh, But I stand from a place where I have no problem pulling the ripcord on anything at any given time if if I don't like the way it's being represented. So we went in with the understanding that I was um, not really excited with the angle that that they took when it came to marketing it, but I was still interested in discussing it and talking about it and sharing it with my audience in ways that I felt like it could benefit me. So we took it from there. Cool. Yeah. And I used your discount code, so also in transparency. <laughs> um, but we both tried it earlier this year. Um, and before we get into all those details and we're going to go through pros, cons, would we recommend it or not? Um, all that juicy stuff, but just to give an overview of blood sugar to start. So continuous glucose monitor, we'll probably say CGM more. It's just what it sounds like, right? We're relating to glucose, AKA blood sugar. So glucose is the simplest form of carbohydrates, right? It is, it is our body's preferred fuel source. So keto people don't come for me. Carbs broken down into glucose is still your body's number one preferred fuel source. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so when we eat, our body immediately starts working to produce glucose from our food. The pancreas is then 
told to release insulin to help shuttle the glucose into our cells, kind of like little, little taxi cabs taking the glucose into our cells. And the glucose then is either stored in our liver or our muscle cells, most commonly for, for the quick fuel. But if there is more than our body can store, that is when we store it as fat. And really fat is just fuel in reserve. That's what our body fat is there for, right? So if we went into a famine, we would still survive. So two common terms, I guess, that come up, I feel like when we're talking about blood sugar, blood glucose, is insulin resistance is one that I hear a lot, especially when I work with women with PCOS, because there's usually an element of insulin resistance. And that is when the liver doesn't recognize the insulin that's in the body and continues to make glucose. So what does that mean? It's usually going to lead to increased body fat over time. And then the other term obviously is diabetes. So one way that diabetes occurs is when the pancreas isn't producing insulin the way that it should. And so that's when people would need injections of insulin because they need more of those taxi cabs to be shuttling the glucose into the cells. So that's kind of like the very quick and dirty <laughs> overview of glucose in the body. Do you think I left anything out, Katie? No, no. I think that makes perfect sense. Okay. And so then a continuous, so like I mentioned, when I first was getting into blood glucose, I used to do the finger pricks every morning, which sucked. Let me be honest. Like I'm fine with blood. I think I have a high pain tolerance. My fingers, like it hurt. I was not looking forward to it in the morning. When I pricked that thing, I would be like, oh, <laughs> like I really didn't like it. Maybe I am a wuss, but no, you're you not. <laughs> <laughs> and anyone, you know, with diabetes, until CGMs became more widely available, that's what they would have to do multiple times throughout the day, right? To be checking in with their blood glucose. So now we have CGMs that are continuous, just like they sound. And they, do you want to kind of describe some of that inserting process? Yeah. So there is a, an applicator, a large applicator that comes and uh, you have to you know, find a fleshy spot on either the back of your arm near your tricep or on your stomach. And it's really simple in terms of application. I mean, you peel a sticky piece back, you stick it to that fleshy part, and then you hit a button and, and, and boom, it's on and you feel nothing. So it is a really slight, tiny, sort of long, inch long needle that goes just like under your skin. It doesn't go like straight in. It goes it, like it kind of I don't know how, like it sort of goes like, I think it runs parallel to it your- like crawls under your skin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's making people feel better, but it's really, it's painless, I think is the point. And you, and it just allows um, enough access to your blood for the reading, which then gets transmitted, of course, um, into an app that you have on your phone. So at any given moment, you are able to open the app and see exactly what your glucose reading is. I think it was something like every three to five minutes is how often yes. mine updated. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah, I agree that it was painless once in a while, like at least the two days following putting it on. Um, cause I did both triceps when I switched them. And if I was in certain weird, like if I was doing a bridge and my triceps were against the ground, like I could kind of feel it. Or if I, I was in some weird position the first like 48 hours, mm -hmm. I could kind of feel it. But other than that, or like surprising myself in the shower, like washing my arm and I'm like, oh my God, what's on me? <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> did you wear the that, cover? Did yes. you wear the cover yes. over it too? Okay. Yeah, me too. So there was a, a, like a sticky thing that you can put over it, which was recommended. I think if you have, if you sweat or, or, you know, do high intensity activities and I, I really do, did neither during the course of this. I wasn't in a, in a place where it was really hot or where I was getting extreme workouts in, but I put it on anyway just because of showers and it just felt more secure to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So much easier than doing. Yes. I mean, that would be a pro right off the bat. Way easier, especially if you are someone who is a diabetic and you need to keep an eye on your blood glucose. Oh, yeah. Like 100%, this would be a million times easier than doing consistent finger pricks off the bat. Um, the other part of this device is, let's hit on that big con you mentioned first. So it's very much, I guess we should talk about this. We're talking about Cygnos, 
I am not endorsed by this company, so I'm just going to say whatever I want. Um, but Signos, it's still not for the record. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Signos yeah. and um, NutriSense are the two that I was aware of beforehand. And since you were working with Signos, I went with them. NutriSense is another one that people could look into that I think is pretty dang similar. Um, mm-hmm. With Signos, when you're opening their app and using it, it is very, 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 very much focused on weight loss. Everything, mm-hmm. all of the verbiage, um, all of all of you know the text, all of like your indicators, um, like when it's telling you to go for a walk after a meal, which we'll get into a little bit. It's all about you could be gaining weight right now if you're out of range. Um, so that was you even warned me about that, and I was still slightly shocked about like how in your face it is. So. Mm-hmm. That's going to be a big disclaimer right off the bat. If you are still struggling with any type of disordered eating, I would 0% recommend this until I did give them this feedback. I sent them an email and I said, you know, you guys should really make like an athlete or an optimization, um, like option that people can check. Yeah. Like, like what is your goal for this device? Like aura ring has that. Are you in recovery or are you in training? I love that. Mm hmm. Because if there was an optimization mode, maybe it would just say like, hey, you know, you're outside of optimal range or whatever, instead of like your body's storing fat right now. I was like, oh, my God. (laughs) Um, It It felt very transactional every like it, it, which was which was frankly something. I had worked really hard to get away from like having oh, this transactional relationship with food and exercise. And I was fortunate to be in a place where I could kind of like see above that when I was getting those messages and I, and I knew, but there was a part of me that was like, dang it. If I was looking at this a year ago, I would be getting on the treadmill or I would be retooling my macros for the rest of the day. And so I think to your point, Caroline, if you are not in a really healthy place where you can trust your body and and override a message like that, this device is not for you right out of the gate. Yes. A hundred percent agree. Yeah. If this would have been me a couple of years ago, I would have spiraled immediately back into an eating disorder pretty much. (laughs) So, so yeah, really important to note that off the bat. Um, and what you see when you look at the app, when we're talking about these ranges is they give you, um, kind of like two bars and your squiggly blood glucose line, two parallel bars, like train tracks and your squiggly blood glucose line is going to go up and down ideally in between those two edges of the train tracks. Um, my range was 83 to 118. And I think Katie, you said yours was 75 to 110. That's right. Mm -hmm. And that probably has to do with we're different ages, we're different weights, we're different heights. They, they take all these factors into account. Um, and there's a calibration period that, that you go through as well. And then they give you these ranges. But I just wanted to note that I did some research on, cause when I first saw that, I was like, this seems way tighter of a range than what I remember previously working with. And based on some articles I read, a healthy non-diabetic range for most people, fasted is 70 to 99. And then postprandial or post-meal after eating, because obviously you're gonna have some blood glucose increase after eating, should be less than 140. So Mm. my range on the app was 22 milligrams per deciliter lower than what most people would consider healthy. So I think that's important to note too, because sometimes I would go like two points above and I would be, let's say 120 post meal. And it would be, you know, flashing at me, telling me to go work out and all this stuff. And I'm like, you know what? Technically healthy is under 140. Like I'm fine. I'm not going to worry about it if I have to go get on a call or something. Um, Did you kind of notice that to you a little bit? I, I did at first, but I, I saw it and, and me kind of wanting to really test this out since I knew I was talking about it. I kind of took those initial alerts as a challenge. And I said, okay, instead of like, I'm not going to try to offset anything. I was certainly not like, cause you, cause here's the thing, what you and I are eating, Caroline, we're not going out and, and having, <laughs> you know, we're not going to like world buffet. Okay. Like we're having our normal meals. And so if I see a spike after a normal meal I know that it's all fine. Like my body knows what to do with this energy. It's going to be okay. But in the interest of following this experiment, what can I do to tweak it? How will it make me feel? What can I change and how will it affect me? That's sort of where my head went. And so for me, 
I mean, it, it, the initial, what, what spiked me first was my, my pumpkin oat bar, which is something that I've been eating for years. It's made, um, it's basically pumpkin, egg, egg whites, oats. Um, that's the, that's the foundation of it all. And, uh, so, you know, high protein, high carb, oh, and protein powder and pretty fast digesting. And so that did spike me in the morning. And here's the thing. If you look at the macros in a vacuum, there was no way something like that was going to make me gain weight. But what I didn't realize it was doing was it was it was causing a spike in my blood sugar, yes, which you know is really never here nor there. I'm not going to say that's a bad thing. It's not. But what happened was that it would spike and then it would come down, and I would be hungry really shortly thereafter. And that to me was not convenient. And that was something that I was like, what's wrong with me that I like when I was in you know a, a different phase? What is wrong with me that I'm eating breakfast and I'm hungry? 90 minutes or two hours later. Well, my glucose was going up and falling again. So I was looking for ways to offset that and combat it. And this is where feedback within the app sort of supported me and helped me find those find those ways to prolong um, my, my glucose at a more stable place so I did feel better and I didn't feel as snacky and as hungry. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, let's get into some of that experimentation and learning a little bit more because I definitely learned a lot too. Um, let's go with your example. So you mentioned protein powders in those bars. And that yeah. was one of the first things I noticed too is whey protein, huge spike, huge spike. And let's talk about that a little bit more because we actually, post-workout is when you are the most insulin sensitive because you've just used up all of that stored glycogen in your muscle cells. And whey protein is, especially like whey protein isolate, is made to be fast digesting, to get your body that spike of recovery post-workout. But here's when doing a bunch of protein shakes doesn't really serve anybody. Because mm -hmm. if you are the person who, you know, for example, like always has a protein shake uh, in the afternoon, and I bet you also have an afternoon slump, because mm -hmm. that it's the crash, it's the coming back down after the spike that usually is going to make you hungry again. And for me, what I really noticed was tired. And it's so funny because prior to wearing this, I had been noticing, I thought I was overtraining or something, which I don't really train that hard anymore. Like I follow my intuitive training program these days, but I had a couple of weeks where I was like, man, I am so tired. You know, I work out, let's say at seven or eight, and then I'm just exhausted at 9 a.m. Like, what am I doing wrong? And then I started wearing this and I'm like, oh my God, it's because I always have a whey protein shake post-workout and that's really not serving my body right now. Uh, so that's one thing that was so helpful. And I've switched to bone broth protein now and I haven't looked back and I don't get those crashes anymore. I had that same experience with my shake at night. So mm. as you know, I've had so much trouble sleeping in, in my experience. And a long time ago, I think it was because I probably didn't have enough calories in my day, but but cut to a time when I had plenty of calories in my day, why was I still having all of this disruption overnight? And I realized, and we can talk, this is going to be like a pro going into a con here in a second. I realized because I would get these alerts at night, and we'll circle back to that in a second, that my my blood glucose was dropping. And, and it was like, and you don't get an alert unless it's like a dangerously low drop, which dangerously low is obviously it within the context of someone like myself who does not have diabetes. Like I, I, I do not need medical assistance when mine gets dangerously low. It's just a, a heads up because that's what this device does. Uh, but I realized that I was having this end of night shake. So there's a little bit of like, I got I had to unpack this a little bit. So I realized that at the end of the night, I needed something that made me feel really full, like, like a pro, a really thick, fluffy protein shake, because I couldn't fall asleep unless I was really full. Like I was hungry almost all the time before I, I tried the CGM. And I really just thought that was my makeup and who I was. I was someone who had to eat a lot of times during the day. I was hungry a lot. And so at bedtime, I was like, okay, I got to eat this big voluminous shake so I can fall asleep and, and not be hungry um, before my, my sleep actually sets in. But what that was doing was causing me to be causing a spike um, in the middle of the night 
which the fatigue isn't that big a deal, but if you're hungry in the middle of the night, your body's going to do everything it can to wake you up again, right? And so that was causing me those issues. And I thought that I was doing myself a favor by having um, a whey casein blend protein right before bed. Turns out that was doing exactly what I just shared. And I too share, moved to a, a beef protein instead. Mm-hmm. So if I'm going to consume protein powder, um, anytime I am going to make sure that it's, it's a beef protein, unless I'm baking, I still do use PE science when I'm baking, but that's a little bit different because again, I'm, you're, you're adding a whole lot of other components when you're assembling a recipe, um, than when you're just having like a straight shake. So I had that exact same spirit experience with, with, you know, the fast digesting protein shakes doing exactly what they're intended to do, by the way. Right. But we just forget about that. And we're bombarded with like, all kinds of protein shakes, you know, in the grocery store ready to go. Yeah. This is why I always tell clients like aim for one protein shake a day max post workout and get the rest of your protein from whole food sources. So again, it's almost like one of those intuitive things, but we forget about it. We forget about mm-hmm. how that might be impacting our bodies, right? I don't know about you, but I felt like so much of this is I mean as I'm as I was learning things about the process of myself and it's like yeah, none of this was new information, but somehow it hit me different when it was on me. Did you get that feeling at all? I'd agree with that because when I started, you know, into my second or third week wearing it, that's when I really was able to link, which is the whole, the, my main motivation was I want to actually have this data, but be able to connect it to what's my body doing with this data so that I can kind of like solidify that body language, if you will. And so I really started noticing that into week two. And I was like, I, before I would eat or something, I would say, oh my God, I'm like, I'm really hungry right now. And I would check my blood glucose and it would be like 80. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's really low. Okay. My body is already telling me my mm-hmm. blood sugar is low and it's time to eat. Like, I don't, you knew so that. like, I knew it. Right. And this was like reaffirming that, that cue from my body. Um, Mm -hmm. so that was really, really cool to notice as well. Like, I feel like it just kind of built up my trust in those cues. If that's kind of what you were meaning to. Absolutely. I, I, it was, it's things that you as a coach had told me many, many times, like increase the, the, the volume or not the volume, like the amount of food you're eating at a meal, make a little bit more nutrient dense choices, add that fat, those are the shifts that I actually got to just see and feel that made all the difference in the world. Moving to a, a meal that was pretty high protein, moderate fat, and on the lower carb side allowed me to stay full for hours and hours and hours. And I know that, again, this doesn't sound like anything revolutionary, but for me in my world, it was. I'm someone who's been hungry all day for years and years and years, and I couldn't figure out why. And it was something as simple as taking the foods I love, but sort of readjusting when I'm having them and, 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 and adding fat or adjusting, you know, the, the level of something in them. And all of a sudden understanding what satiety actually felt like. And that to me was revolutionary. And you, and I have a similar background in this of like being, I'm going to say brainwashed with the low fat high carb, high protein approach, which I got over that pretty quickly because I freaking love fats. But you, (laughs) I remember you had a lot of resistance when I was like, let's up your fats. And you were like, no, (laughs) Uh no, I didn't. Well, and I didn't enjoy fat the way I enjoyed carb. And and this was the other big thing. I knew that carb equated volume and fat did not. True. And so I was like, no, I, I will be like, I'm going to be hungry anyway. I, I, need to have at least something filling my stomach. And that was wrong. That was not right for me. I mean, mm-hmm. and I, and maybe, and again, like this is so important to continue to reiterate that this is me and this is my experience. And I'm not suggesting that anyone who, who is, who feels the same way I had, did about carbs, this is going to work the same way like that. This is so unique to me, but these were my breakthroughs and, and awareness that just rose up in a new way, even though I had you, a coach holding my hand for two years, telling me these things, somehow this hit different, maybe because I got to see it and hear it and feel it all together in tandem. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, right. We're not doctors. Like we're both just sharing our experience if that's not obvious because this is just a podcast. So (laughs) 
Yeah. But let's let's stick with this uh, this idea, this theme of other habits we're taking away. Yeah. So my huge one for me, um, I guess this kind of goes in into a pattern, but I realized that I almost always had really low blood sugar in the morning, um, where actually it's more common for people to have an increase. I think it's called the dawn effect where mm-hmm. you actually your blood glucose usually goes up a little bit in the morning and that helps your body wake up. I usually woke up with pretty low, um, blood glucose and I would have, I could eat like anything for breakfast. Like I even had, um, like those Trader Joe's gluten-free coffee cake muffins that are so freaking good. Oh. And I didn't really get like big spikes. So, but with lunch and with dinner, it was much easier for me to get a glucose spike with what I was eating. So one of the things this app does, like we mentioned before, if your glucose starts spiking, it basically freaks out at you and it sends you like a badge and it starts a countdown timer of 30 minutes. And it says, you better go for a walk. Otherwise you're gaining weight right now. (laughs) And yeah, not so many words, but yeah, it was right? very close to that. It, it definitely felt like you have this countdown amount of time left to offset what you just did, basically. Yes. Like mm-hmm. it almost felt punitive, which is super sucky. Like I was getting so mad at my phone. I'm like, are you kidding me? And sometimes I wouldn't, you know, I don't always eat with my phone. And so sometimes I would pick up my phone like 35 minutes after eating, and it'll be like, expired warning, you were gaining weight. And I'm like, oh my God. But I will say I did implement that habit once in a while of taking walks after meals. Like if I'm going to have ice cream or a dessert, or if I am going to have a really high carb lunch, um, like pizza or something, going for a walk had a huge impact. And it doesn't have to be you know, busting ass. Like I would just walk around my neighborhood for like 10 minutes and it would be enough to, I would still have an increase in blood glucose, but it wouldn't be this big, like, you know, mountain peak. It would be like a rolling hill (laughs) and then come back down. So that's one habit that I really, really disliked how they presented it, but it actually is beneficial. (laughs) Yes, I agree that I had the same takeaway too. Um, One of the other things I I really disliked about the app was the tracking was really cumbersome when it came to entering foods in there. And and I felt like, so, I mean, I, I could, I could do my fitness pal with my eyes closed and and that was a piece of cake. And I always sort of complained about it. I thought it kind of had me in golden handcuffs, but that is so user-friendly compared to the Cygnos tracking. Um, And I would, I would say if you're someone who eats sort of the same thing, most days or you have had a meal, like if you, if you input it one or two or three times, the system knows and can, will start to predict what it's going to do for you. Or it'll say, Oh, last time you had this, you had a spike or, um, this, this is predict, not predicting any spike if you have this. And so there is benefit to taking the time to actually enter the food because then the system can predict it for you. But if you're someone who wants to eat something different every day and has to go in and enter it every single time, it gets really old really fast. What do you think? Yeah. And let's highlight that because one of the questions I got after I shared that I was wearing this was, should I just do this because I can't track my food and this will be easier? Would you recommend I just get a CGM? And I'm like, hell no, this is not easier in any way, shape, or form. This is just for nerds, I feel like, or people who actually are concerned about their blood sugar. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. This is something you have to really want to see the data. And, and I will tell you there was, I did have one day where we were, we were at like, I don't know, some auction or something. So it was a night where I was eating um, a lot of foods that were high fat, high carb, like snack style on a table, like continuously sort of eating for a, a number of hours, which is not something like we, we generally try to do. Uh, and I found now I was really good at tracking it. I, 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 went back, I put it all in there and I did the timing because I wanted to see and I wanted to know. And I'm glad I did because I was eating things like, um, Mm -hmm. you know, squares of cheese and chocolate covered almonds and crackers and like peanut butter cups, like all the kind of snacks you'd see on a table if you were at a party. Right. And over the course of like three hours, I was having bite after bite after bite after bite. My glucose level, level never spiked because I was having 
small quantities really slowly over an extended amount of time. And that to me was like the most brilliant feedback I'd ever received. Like I, I was like, my body knows exactly what to do with this energy. And the fact that I'm enjoying the experience and I'm having a little bit at a time and I'm not having like handfuls of anything. It's like a bite of this and a bite of that. And it was like, I, it was almost as if I had barely had a meal at all. It was a really low increase and it came, a slope and it came back down again. And I would have never predicted that. And I probably would have never gathered that if I hadn't taken the time to like align exactly what I was eating. I probably would have been like, yeah, I, I am pretty sure I can't have like Reese's peanut butter cups because there's no way that's not going to spike me, right? Well, they, did, they didn't spike me. It didn't spike me at all. And I'm so glad that I watched that and, and took the time to do it. Yeah. So like, that's a big takeaway that I had too. Like, um, I do better with just having meals versus snacks, but that your portion sizes definitely matter. And for me, the order of eating would matter too. Like if I started my meal eating fiber, like eating veggies, there would be less of a spike. If I then had rice, let's say if I started a meal eating my rice, I would have a faster and quicker spike. So the Mm -hmm. food tracking in the app, I think is totally necessary. If you're going to get a CGM, you got to track your food. But just to reiterate, it's not my fitness pal. It is way less user friendly. And not only do you have to track all of your food if you want to actually know how your body's responding to these meals, but you also, you just touched on this, you have to choose your starting and ending time. Um, Mm -hmm. And those have to be pretty accurate too, if you want to actually match the data. So again, Mm -hmm. like this person who asked me this question of, should I just get a CGM because I don't want to track my food? Tracking your food and getting to know your macros is -hmm. like the very basics of nutrition for a reason. It's Mm -hmm. pretty dang easy. Once you get the hang of it, you only need one app. There's a lot to learn. It's very foundational and Mm -hmm. it's still foundational to using a CGM. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting, something you just touched on that kind of bugged me. There's so much, again, conversation about, weight loss and, you know, stay, keep your glucose level steady and you'll lose weight. I probably had 600 calories over the course of that steady glucose period. And I certainly was not in a position to lose weight having a meal like that. But, and then I'm thinking about you talking about how, you know, order of order of operations, right? Well, if, if you eat the rice first and the fiber last, you are still netting the same number of calories from your meal. You're not going to lose weight just because your glucose stays steady. I think what's what is sort of and maybe we can extrapolate this a little bit. Like if that, then why would we care about our glucose being steady at all? Like what is the point of all of this? Like maybe we talk about that a little bit too. Yeah, totally. Gosh, that's such a good point because that was the other thing I noticed. I was just like scouring the app to be like, where are my calorie and macro totals? Mm-hmm. They don't actually have your daily totals anywhere. They, so they like, do, but it's not what? again. It's not they where do. Is it? <laughs> I never found it. You know what? I haven't opened the app in two months, so I don't know. But they have your cat. It's really, it, it's, it's again, it's cumbersome. But they do have your, your totals, but they don't like total them by meal. Like by meal, they only give you your percentages and your total calorie number. But you can see your total at the end of the day. There's like a calendar you go to and you can click the date, like a, a, whatever the day is. It'll give you the total for that day. Okay. Well, but anyway. I never anyway. saw that <laughs> and I was I frustrated. I, it wasn't easy to find. You're right. Um, but I mean, yeah, so it didn't necessarily equate to what a calorie deficit just because you were had a steady glucose level for the day. And that mm-hmm. frustrated me because there was just so much language about that. What it did do, what the steady glucose level for me did do was it made it easier for me to be full longer. And that was the magic of this. It wasn't, and I did lose a little bit of weight, but it was not the, the, my, not the point of this going into it. But for me, again, being somebody who's been hungry for years to suddenly forget about food, I mean, it makes me almost emotional because this is something that you know I've struggled with for so, so long. And I just felt like I was missing something. And I don't want anyone to think that like (laughs) the CGM like showed me the light and that was the missing piece. That's not it. Like this just all sort of came together all at once for me. And I feel like I, for whatever reason, this was just where I was in the moment I realized how to 
lift the food focus that I felt like had been plaguing me for so long. And a lot of it, I think, was, um, what's the word, physiological, where like physiologically, uh, my body was just responding to what I was putting in it. Like it wasn't, it wasn't doing anything wrong. It was doing exactly what it needed to do based on how I was fueling myself. And just a couple small tweaks with the way I was fueling myself made this astronomical difference in my satiety and my satisfaction. And I'd just been trying to hit that for years. And finally I did. Yeah. And I'd say my biggest takeaway for keeping blood glucose within my range, my weight stayed because I was, the the app also wants you to weigh yourself every day. So again, very weight focused. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't really lose any weight. It was just, you know, like up a pound, down a pound, like how my life just is now (laughs) these days. Mm -hmm. But a big takeaway for me was energy. Um, Mm -hmm. my energy levels very much evened out. So if you're someone, which again, like maybe we can bring this full circle and talk about how this can also be intuitive. You don't have to, you know, one of the cons of, of CGMs is this, this Cygnos is 299 for just 30 days with your code. I used, I got it for 239 for one month of use. Right. So that's very expensive. I would say, um, for being able to use an app and also having to do a lot of work, but Mm -hmm. So if you're someone who you're like, well, I want to also not have as much food focus. I want to not have afternoon slump. I want to have steady energy and feel good and satiated all day. What are some ways that people can do this intuitively? My biggest tip would be checking in with yourself pre and post meals, which if you're practicing any type of mindful eating, hopefully you're doing that already. But just like that, those simple body checks. How am I feeling before I eat this? How hungry am I? How am I feeling after I eat this? How satiated am I? What would be some other of those like intuitive cues that you feel like people could use if they weren't going to go get a CGM? For me, I've been really focused on waiting for the breath. For me, when I'm almost full, I, in, if, I if I'm quiet enough, I, re- I realize that there is a pause and I take a deep breath. And then I'm, and then that is almost a moment. And and it's not something that it's not an intentional deep breath. It's a deep breath that my body just expels in a moment as I'm eating. If I'm not shoveling food in my mouth so fast and your breathing is pretty normal, I will suddenly just take a deep breath. And if I can just pause for one second after that deep breath, usually I want to push my plate away. And that is one of those things that I learned from slowing down and, and certainly breath work before a meal was helpful, but waiting for the breath mid meal was one of those super intuitive things that, that can come up for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, um, again, here's where tracking your food can be still, you know, one of the best tools. If, if you have a health issue, right. Or something else going on, tracking your food is always going to give you the best data because I do hear a lot of, you know, afternoon energy crashes and things like that. Really look at your lunch, like track your lunches for a week Mm-hmm. And notice if there are days where it's worse or where it's better. And you can pretty much learn this data, right? Mm-hmm. Or if you're someone who works out in the morning and you always have a protein shake, but then you're tired most of the morning, look at your protein shake, right? And you will start to just, you can, I think the CGM is helpful. Like you said, it's kind of a a let's tie it all together because now you have this extra piece of data that's really hard to get otherwise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But also if you are slowing down, if you are practicing mindfulness with your food, but also just being in your body and you're tracking your food, that's going to give you just as much data. Mm-hmm. No, it's it's true. And for me too, I mean, I, I have to continue to remind myself that fat is a fuel that my body really does appreciate and I cannot neglect it. And when I do that, when I do kind of go back to something that tastes really good or that I, I, I love but doesn't have a lot of fat in it, I have to just accept the consequences and know that I will be hungry in an hour and a half. If I start the day, so I didn't have the same experience you did. I really can't start the day with something sweet. I, re- I said can't. I, if, if I start the day with something sweet, I know that I will be more hungry throughout the day. If I start the day with something savory, something like whole eggs, something like last night's dinner, um, and even if I want to put something sweet on the tail end of that breakfast, it is going to be a different kind of day for me. And and so 
that's something that I would consider that I would recommend somebody considering is flip your day. See what happens. What if you have dinner for breakfast and breakfast for dinner? How does that make you feel? Something as simple as that, where you're not even changing your macros, you're not even changing the foods you're eating, could be something that helps you too. It might be that easy. And let's not forget too, we've talked a lot about food, but sleep and stress were two other huge factors that I noticed. Obviously, like our minds... uh, I do feel like because of the pressure that especially women get put on their physique and because diet culture is this multi-billion dollar industry, we always think like, okay, food is the problem. I should fix food. But it's very, very oftentimes there's more than that going on. So we've Mm -hmm. talked a lot about the food, but I know for me, if I didn't sleep well, oh my God, my blood sugar was all over the place the next day. And I had one time where I have an old kind of CrossFit nagging injury and I had a little bit of a flare up and I consider that a lot of stress to my body, physical stress. And same thing, like my blood sugar was elevated almost all day. It was crazy because my body was trying to fight that inflammation. Did you, did you have experiences like that? You know, not a stress that wasn't like an acute stress, like like a workout or a stress like that. I didn't have any any ancillary stresses like that. Um, I did notice with hydration, if I wasn't hydrated, I, I would get a spike. That happened once after um, I took Redstone on a really long walk up uh, the Ice Age Trail. And I went farther than I wanted to go. And it was hot. And I didn't bring water. And when I got home, like when I was out there, I dropped. And when I got home... I soared and it was, and this was so funny, Caroline, because it gave me that warning where it was like, you, you, you've reached this area and you should probably, you know, because I went to enter some food and they were like, you should go for a walk. Right. You shouldn't be eating your blood glucose is high. But I was like, all the profanity at you CGM, because I know what I need right now. And it's, and it's not more um, fasting. So that I mean, I, I I agree that there are so many different components um, beyond just just food, and so to consider that as well, and exercise, like the impact that exercise has um, on the CGM as well. For sometimes it would force me, it would it would cause me to be really low, and sometimes it would cause me to spike if I was doing a hit workout. Yes, I had that experience too. Like going for a walk post meal was almost always beneficial. But if I did like a really long hike, like you just said, or if I did a really hard strength workout first thing in the morning my blood sugar would would either have like a huge spike or sometimes just like totally plummet. And yeah. I was like, okay, I guess I overdid it in one way or another. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, yeah, there's, I don't think that more than, uh, I think, I think more than 30 days of this would have been too much for me, for sure. When I signed up for this, I thought maybe I could do 60 or 90 because like then how cool it would be i'd like get some vacations some holidays stuff like that in there i don't see a need for anyone thinking about doing this um for committing to anything more than 30 days because i think that you really get a good a good idea of 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 what life looks like as long as you can commit to making your lifestyle normal like i would definitely recommend not recommend somebody go you know sometimes you buy a device or you get a coach and you sort of go all in and you do your best and it's like you have to sort of look at this as putting it into the life that you currently have otherwise it's really not going to work for you if you're trying to be optimal before you even can get results if that makes sense do you Mm -hmm. do you have any thoughts on that well what i was going to say is i forgot to mention this but i signed up for the 30 days and i only did 20 days um because i was so over it (laughs) Okay. Yeah. And because the other part, which this might be able to let us go into some like rapid fire of any cons we didn't touch on, but when you, so the, uh, sensor itself only lasts 10 days. So you have to switch it every 10 days. And when you switch it, you have to do it, um, in a period where you don't work out or you don't eat for two hours. So, um, for me, right? I didn't do that. Oops. You did it? I oh know. yeah. You're supposed to do two hours every time. Yeah. I, even, I thought it was just the first time. I thought it was too, but then it prompted me when I replaced my sensor the second time, it was like, make sure you have two hours saved tomorrow morning. And I was like, I have oh. to do this again. So 
Okay, maybe it's not that important. <laughs> Probably. Okay, well, I mean, I didn't, okay, I missed that. But <laughs> you're right, though, about that, those two hours, like, and let's be honest, the two hours after taking that, that the, the glucose spike, like the, the sugar oh, the water, drink, like you do for pregnancy. That, mm-hmm. Yeah, that was brutal to, because I don't know how much was in that, but that was, I think, 90 milligram or whatever, it was, whatever the number was, it was, it was astronomical. And I was sick after that. Like, yeah, so. They have you do a glucose tolerance test too. So if you order this, that comes with your kit. And yeah, I felt absolutely sick. Um, mm-hmm. So that's that's super fun. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but also with another con for me and why I only lasted 20 days was, um, I don't know if this was just, I have very fair sensitive skin, but when I took it off, I had a, like definitely a, a bruised area and it took my skin probably like two weeks and I have homemade calendula oil that I was putting on it. And it still probably took two weeks until my skin looked like kind of back to normal because of the glue and because of the, the pinprick. Um, so I would just keep that in mind for people. And also what I, what I learned with the, this is going to be totally personal con for me. I, do not like having something external in my body, especially after I took it off the first time and I saw how long the needle is that's under your skin. It yeah. is long, you guys. Oh my God. And like I said, I'm pretty pretty good with gross stuff, but I was like, okay, this thing has been glued to me and in my body for 10 days and now I have to put a new one in. I like, I would never make it with breast implants. Like, <gasps> no way. I the, the whole foreign body in my body thing it really messed with me, which I know is like a little bit weird, but that was another reason that I was like, I'm not putting this third one on. I'm done. (laughs) No, I get that. I mean, I was at the tail end of the third one. I was very done too. And I was sort of just doing, I mean, the last couple days of the third one, I was just testing anything I felt like testing at that point. I was like, I have a couple days left. Let's just see what this cotton candy does. Like I would never <laughs> eat cotton candy, but I'm gonna, I'm curious. I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch this and see what happens. And that to me was a really cool exercise in watching my body do what it already knows how to do. It doesn't need a device to tell it what to do. It doesn't need any other exogenous pressure point telling it what to do. Like it will do it because I because it's wise and because I'm a human and it's amazing. So, I mean, I think like trusting my, it it really, for me, I could see how somebody could use this as a weapon and, and they would lose trust in their body. But I feel like I came into it at a point where I was fortunate and it allowed me to gain trust into my body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. What other, any other cons you wanted to mention? The alarm when you get too low. Okay, oh so God. in the beginning, especially the calibration period in the beginning, at night, and again, I was talking about how my blood sugar would drop at night because I would have that shake and that would cause it to drop. So when your blood sugar drops to what is termed like dangerously low level, the alarm that sounds, it, 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 it's, I can't even explain it. It's like, a, it's like a living nightmare. It's so shrill and scary and loud. And so it's it worse than a smoke detector. Oh yeah. Like, oh yeah. yeah. Well, then it's on your phone. So it's right by your, your, well, for in my room, it was like on my bedside table and there's no way to turn it off unless you disconnect the app from the, the piece that, unless you make it, unless you disconnect it. Um, and I didn't want to because I wanted to see the data. And so I ended up, but they also want you to have it close enough to the CGM on your body so that it continues to transmit. So like, I finally sort of hacked it and like put it in my closet, which was like a wall away in an underwear drawer. And I was like, all right, and it ended up like still being connected. Um, but yeah, the first, until I kind of figured out how to keep my glucose steady at night, when it would go off, it was awful. I was so, I was, I was so mad about that. <laughs> that happened to me at least twice during the calibration period. And mm-hmm. let's be clear, like this is another downfall of the app. Because even I had every notification turned off. I was like, after the first time it happened, I was like, no, all these notifications, turn them gray, like no green lights over there. And Mm -hmm. it still went off because it's like a safety precaution. If you are diabetic, I think you can really be getting into trouble at that point. Um, Mm -hmm. But I was like freaking sleeping just fine. (laughs) Um, So I ended up like disconnecting mine and then I would just like lose the whole night of data, but I couldn't Mm -hmm. hang. 
So yeah, yeah. that's important to, to, cause it happened one other time, just like randomly. I think after I had alcohol, it happened that night. So, which mm-hmm. isn't a good reminder too, if you're drinking alcohol, that definitely also messes with your blood glucose, but mm-hmm. yeah, that was yeah. a big con. Yeah, absolutely. No, that one was, that was rough too. <laughs> I'm trying to see if there's any other cons that I, I mean, I think we cut, we touched on all the ones that. Yeah. The, the one other brief one that I thought of was this is kind of an unsustainable product in terms of like how we treat mother earth and our materials, because you put on one applicator and I get it. They made it super user-friendly when you, when you install this in your arm, but -hmm. there's a lot of waste. Like the applicator itself is like the size it's bigger. It's like two fists, two of my fists probably about of plastic that ends up being waste. Mm -hmm. Um, so I do just think that's also, you know, important to consider, like, especially, which maybe that's my own fault because I'm not diabetic. I don't quote unquote need this. I just wanted mm-hmm. to nerd out on it. So mm-hmm. just being, being mindful of obviously what, con- what you're consuming and what waste you're creating too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There, I mean, there's a lot of, of this. I feel like this is the beginning of this trend too. Um, there's another company and I'm not going to move forward with them, but there's another company on the market that just reached out to me about, um, like you basically, I think it's testing for ketones. Like you, you breathe into something and it tells you like what, how it basically, it, it, it's marketing hook is like, hack your metabolism. We'll tell you how to eat today to lose weight. And it's like, I, I, that kind of stuff just drives me bananas. And I feel like this is so close to something like that again, because it's marketed under this weight loss umbrella. When in reality, for me, it helped me get to a, a point that, um, transcended weight loss. Like it had nothing to do with weight loss, but I think unfortunately they're targeting a really vulnerable population that may think, Oh, I can get, get, I can find my weight loss sweet spot if I just stay within my glucose range. But that's not true to me. That's the biggest con is that I feel like it, it is almost a little bit of a a, a bait and switch on that. Yeah. Because one, it's definitely not easy. I hope we have made that clear. This is not an easy approach to nutrition and two, yeah, there's no focus on um, macronutrients from from my perspective. Even if you can see it and I missed it, there's still no focus there. So you could be eating a diet that has like no protein in it and you could just lose muscle and see the scale go down. And that's not healthy long term. That's not going to do you any favors and it's not going to actually make you have like that athletic physique that you probably want if, if aesthetics are your goals. So yeah, that I would totally agree. That's like the biggest con of all is that they're treating it like it's a, some sort of shortcut or some sort of like easy approach to fat loss. And it's just not, no, no, it's not. I I mean, if anything, you almost need to go, like, if you're a beginner, if you're someone who's just getting started on your journey, this is definitely not for you. I think going in with a really solid foundational understanding of macros and what it is you need to, um, achieve a calorie deficit and to, you know, maintain muscle, um, status, all that kind of thing is, is super important because I mean, for a lot of people too, like if it's suggesting something like eat more fiber or, um, try pairing this with protein or something, it's like, what does that even mean? Like, unless you, unless you know that, unless you have that foundational knowledge, um, it's, it's like another language. So, um, true. Yeah. Something else. Good point. And then also though, there were some pros, like we talked about, you know, I think we both said we learned a lot from, our portion sizes and meal timing. And for me, definitely like how sleep and stress affect uh, my blood sugar, which again, I do think you can learn a lot of these things by tuning in to your body more and more, but it is helpful to have that data, especially like you said, if you already have that foundation, it can be cool. If you want to really go the extra mile and make the investment in this, um, it will give you a lot of very, very individualized, right? Because this is specifically your body. Like Katie and I are just talking about what happened in our bodies. You could have different results. So I think that was a pro to like really be able to change my my meal composition, for example, and specifically see how that affected my blood sugar. Yeah. I, I liked how I could put something, I could enter something and it could say, we predict this is what your blood sugar will look like. And I thought that was pretty cool too, as, as a reminder, like, oh yeah, you had this once before and it went really well for you. Or if I put something in that caused a spike, it would note that too. And to which, you know, 
I would say, okay, well, I still want to have it. So here are my options. I am either going to, you know, adjust the composition of what I'm going to eat surrounding it. I'm going to change the order or I'm a grown ass woman and I'm going to have it anyway because I want it and I can. And so as long as you're approaching everything with that attitude, I think that, that it, you can really find um, a, you can probably have a really good experience with this. And again, we have complained, we've said a lot of cons, but for me, I wouldn't change a thing. Like I, I know Caroline, you couldn't finish it off, but I am really glad I did the 30 days. I gained a lot of insight and, uh, just another, I don't know, just, just so much more trust in my body and so many more tools and resources to combat an issue that I had been working so, so long to really kind of overcome. Yeah. And I, yeah, and I still, I'm very, very glad that I did it um, because I also had the opinion just from like podcasts I've heard in the past and research that I've done that it was kind of easy, easy, useful data. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I'm glad I did it to learn that like, oh, wow, like this is a good reminder. There just are no shortcuts to, to learning about what you eat and learning how it affects your body. Um, And I think I just, for me, Another reason I think I I only did 20 days was because those last couple of days, those like 15 days, 15 to 20, probably I was like, oh, you know what it was? They give you little challenges as you get further in, like further along, like you've used it longer. And yeah. one of their challenges, which I loved this, this would definitely be a pro. One day it had you, if you open the app, it would prompt you and it would say, guess your blood glucose right now. Yes. Yeah. And I got it right Every fucking Me time. Too. Nailed Me too. it. Yeah. I got it with so, one every time. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I think I think most of the times I got it like on the head. And then one time, yeah, I was like one or two off. Oh. And to me, that's that's when I really made the decision of like, I'm not putting this third one on because yeah. I can check in. I can, it's asking me, what do you think your blood sugar is? I can take a deep breath, check in with my body, check in with my hunger and fullness, my energy. And I know what my blood sugar is. Yeah. So one, that's a pro because it does prove that like, if you're paying attention, you can learn. Um, and two, like it did have skillful games built in the mm-hmm. longer that you went, which I mm-hmm. thought was cool. And I was like, oh my yeah. God, finally, they're taking it a little bit away from weight loss. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. there like, there definitely are some pros. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that because yeah, there were days too, where they were like, try to um, do a, a 20 minute walk before your next meal or see what happens if you do a walk post your last meal. And, and it would, you know, give you a little green check mark if, and when you did that, but it was really interesting to do things that were outside of my routine. And, you know, maybe you're someone who I did get a message from somebody who said, you know what, they're sent, they're telling me to go for a walk after lunch and I can't because I work and it, I, I hate the way that makes me feel. And I think it's so important to remember that you have to, with, a, with something like with technology like this, you have to just take what works for you and leave what doesn't. Okay. So maybe there's someone out there who never considered taking um, a walk as part of their lunch break and maybe now they're doing that. Or if you're someone who absolutely can't do that, then you've got to just let that go. And if you don't want to kind of adjust the food you're eating during that time, then you have to just be okay with that and, and learn to maybe tweak something somewhere else along what, however it works with your lifestyle, like making sure your lifestyle fits into something like this is what it's all about and and not retooling everything you do to get this perfect, even line. Um, that should never be the goal. And I hope that nobody thinks that that was ever what you or I were trying to achieve in this. Mm -hmm. And that's a really important reminder too, that like your body is supposed to have a glucose increase when you eat. So the goal isn't to like ever have just like a steady line throughout the day. You want your blood sugar to go up and down as Mm -hmm. you eat. What, what I feel like we both kind of learned was how to, um, kind of narrow that range a little bit so that you Mm -hmm. don't have energy crashes so that your satiety is better, um, et cetera. So I did. Yeah. I learned what that felt like. I really don't think I ever knew what a glucose crash felt like. I heard the term, Mm -hmm. but now I could equate how I was feeling when I was hungry 90 minutes after my first meal and run down and fatigued or waking up in the middle of the night. Now I know what those things are and I can solve for them, but that's all that has nothing to do with anything else. Mm Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, definitely, definitely some pros there too, right? I feel like we were a little harsh at the beginning, but there are some, (laughs) there are, there's a reason that 
um, CGM companies, I think, have started marketing this as mm-hmm. like a this is the new tool for you because you can totally nerd out with this as much as you want. Yeah. Um, and then I think we talked a lot about those those main surprises, if you will, that spiked our blood sugar too. Like we both said whey protein. Rice mm-hmm. was a big one for me, even when I mixed it with a with a meal that is quote unquote healthy. Injury, sickness, stress. Yeah. Um, you mentioned oatmeal being one or like fruit and by itself. Apples was one that surprised me. So at night, sometimes I would have an apple right before bed if my stomach was growling and that did me no favors. But if I had some yogurt with fat in it, I was good for the night. So like mm. two excellent foods in terms of they both nutrient dense one of them actually and arguably the apple has fiber in it so like maybe you go for the apple instead of the two good yogurt that has some sugar in it but for me the yogurt was better because it had some some you know whole foods protein and some fat in it so definitely eye-opening definitely yeah so that yeah. was a pro too foods food selection yeah right and that's why I, I remember i texted you like the first week i was using it like um, do I actually have to track my food on this, Katie? And you're like, yes, because yes, eventually it tells you more. I'm like, fine. <laughs> but it was, it was helpful to start to see those patterns. Yeah. Um, yeah. and then blood sugar dips, you got to learn what caused that too. And like how I mentioned, um, this is another great reason why no one approach works for everyone. Like the mm-hmm. fact that my blood sugar was consistently low in the morning, almost, almost no matter what I ate is another reason that I kind of solidified why I don't do intermittent fasting. You know, and why I feel terrible (laughs) when I do that type of time restricted eating. And now I I have the data to back it up. I always knew that. I never, I would try it once in a while and I'd be like, this is, this super sucks. Mm -hmm. Um, And now I know it's because I always had lean towards low blood sugar in the morning. So even also learning from when your blood sugar is low was really helpful. Did you change any foods the way I did? Like with the apple and the and the yogurt, was there anything that you were like, oh gosh, maybe that's not great in and of itself for me? Um, I, you know, not not in that like concrete way. What right. I did okay. more is change the order of how I ate things. Like, yeah. cause really eating veggies first made a big impact. Mm-hmm. And then also just kind of, you know, like I don't love rice, but I used to eat a lot of rice. And so now that I saw that that spiked my blood sugars more than some other carbs. I was like, oh, okay, I'll just be mindful that in the future. And maybe I'll have slightly less rice and maybe pair it with like potato and extra veggie instead of doing like sometimes, I don't know, bodybuilding days, like rice is, I eat rice all day, every day in in those days. So now, now I'm just like, "Ah, maybe I just won't eat as much like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But I didn't do a lot of like, I'm going to swap this for this like you did. Yeah, I, that well, the apple only came to me when I realized the um, the protein powder d- was doing that. I was like, well, an apple's not that much different than the protein in the sense that there's just I was eating it plain. Maybe if I had put peanut butter on it, it would have been a different situation. But um, I, I didn't because I was just looking for like a light snack. So yeah, it, it, pretty pretty interesting. But um, that's I that's I guess another thing. Like I don't do a lot of snacks. I do if I'm gonna have a quote unquote snack. I do like a small meal. <laughs> Which, That's so much harder now. I didn't, I couldn't yeah. do that before. I mean, you, yeah, you probably recall, like I just had so much trouble bridging myself from meal to meal to meal. And now I have, like my meals are probably six, 700 calories each. And, and I have three to four of them. And like, that's it. And it's so much more satisfying. I have so much more energy. I still... And when I say a meal, like I'm still having chocolate and I'm still having, you know, sweet things or something that I, like things I truly, really enjoy. They're just on my plate, so to speak. I'm having them, I'm consuming them all at the same time, as opposed to having like dinner and then an hour later dessert. Like I'm just kind of combining things. True. I did start doing that more too. Like if I, I don't really do protein bars that much anymore either because of the whey protein and Also, because I just think, I don't know, they just don't do it for me the way that they used to. (laughs) But if I do still have one once in a while, I'll like eat lunch and then immediately eat a protein bar. Whereas Mm -hmm. I used to eat lunch and then maybe like an hour, two hours later, eat a protein bar. 
now I don't do that because I know it's going to affect my blood sugar differently. And yeah. as long as I'm getting the calories in, like, I don't care. I'll eat it. That's it. <laughs> it's an yeah. easy change. Yeah, it is. And I think that's how I was able to, that's how I lost weight because I was eating fewer calories by just actually not being hungry in between meals where I was constantly needing more food because my stomach was legitimately mm. growling all the time. And it was like, just, I couldn't understand. I was just like, this is just the way I'm built. Like I'm just somebody, you know, they say everybody has, you know, different needs. And and I just felt like I was always going to be someone who woke up in the middle of the night and who, you know, was hungry all the time. And I just am happy to realize that that's not the way it is. That's important to to emphasize too, though. Like, it's not like you used a CGM and immediately lost weight. You know right. that you changed your calories overall. Right. Mm -hmm. 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, no. From the beginning, I never, I mean, again, I was really staunch in my position on this. And I told them I didn't want to even begin to have a conversation if they thought that I was going to tout it for weight loss. And then when the time came and I had to do the recap, I felt like it would be irresponsible to neglect the weight loss conversation altogether because I know that's what people want to hear about. That's everybody wants to know about, well, but what is the number? What do the numbers say? And I didn't weigh myself every day. I weighed myself. Um, I did it for one month. I weighed myself four times. Mm -hmm. I it was, and, and by the way, it was the first four times I weighed myself since I had stopped weighing myself. So that was, which was probably like over a year prior to that. So I was really uncomfortable with the idea of stepping on the scale, but I did it. I did it for the data. And so that's another thing I'd say, if you're someone who's like, either don't include the weight, the, the weight component, or maybe now's not the right time for you. If you are triggered by weight because the the conversation and that component is just so currently such a big piece of it. Caroline, you had the best suggestion. If they could come up with a way to like have a, a different purpose and optimize it for different, different efforts, that would be a game changer for somebody like me. I think I'd be mm -hmm. much more, um, I think it'd be much more inclusive and I'd be much more supportive if it wasn't really targeted at weight loss. Oh yeah. Because if you don't weigh yourself, it tells you like, Hey, you didn't <laughs> weigh yourself today. And yep. all day on your home screen, it's like, weigh yourself. And I'm like, yep. oh my God, I'm getting my period. I'm not going to weigh myself. Like, right. <laughs> I don't weigh myself the last week of my cycle, dude. I know. <laughs> but, but yeah. Uh, so, so I think a great way to wrap this up would be, you know, in, in conclusion, based on everything you learned in your experience and, you know, these pros and cons, would you recommend a CGM to healthy non-diabetic individuals? I would say if you are someone who can approach this data from a place of curiosity and not judgment, then yes, it's, it's fun. It's cool. Yes. But if you are, have other things you need to work on first, like trust issues with your body, if you have, um, you know, loving yourself where you are, mindset stuff, which let's be honest, most of the people who are considering CGMs today have these other three things to work on first, then no. So I, I realized I kind of towed two lines there. I, I know that wasn't exactly fair, but that's, that's my answer. <laughs> okay. I think that's fair. Cause yeah, I would, I would, there's caveats with right. recommending it. Right. Because I would say that the things I would add would be if you don't have experience tracking your food or you haven't been consistent for like a long period of time tracking your macros and really learning about what's in your food, how much are you eating? Don't don't do this. Don't do this. It's just going to totally overcomplicate it and you will get burnt out. I am so used to data and tracking and I got burnt out. Mm -hmm. So so I think that's really important to remember. Um and yeah, I think I would only recommend it to people who are willing to look at their phone for like a lot of the day <laughs> specifically for this data. Like if that kind of excites you, if you're like, yeah, I want to, I want to be looking at like tracking all of my food. And I want to see if, if my walk changes this in the middle of the day and how my workout changes it at 5 PM. And cause you also like, that's another thing I guess we didn't really talk about is I ended up looking at my phone a lot. Like my screen time report was up <laughs> on average okay. because of because of the checking. But if yeah. that excites you, if you're like, no, I want to spend my time and energy looking at this data, then yeah, yeah do it. But if that's overwhelming or if you 
everything that you mentioned, like if you um, have any type of still disordered eating that you're dealing with, hard no. Mm -hmm. Agree. A hundred percent agree. This is not for somebody with any sort of disordered eating behavior or someone who's even been triggered by any of this conversation. Not for you. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It is not there. There is no shortcut, you guys. No. <laughs> There's no magic pill. There's no, this is finally the key. It's always comes back to learning how your body responds to different foods and eating a diet that is mostly food that comes directly from the earth. And I think I have to add to that because I know I shared a couple like breakthroughs I had while using the CGM. A lot of that came after years and years of work with you. I think that's, mm -hmm. I, I cannot, that cannot be overstated that I worked with you one-to-one -one since I think early 2020, no, 2019, I think. And we, we started, you know, from a pretty macro fitness focused place. And it didn't take us both long to realize that like we, I needed to shift my goals to, um, you know, more, more insight to who I am and serving myself, as I said at the beginning of the podcast. And that took a hell of a lot longer than I wanted it to take. Like I really would have appreciated it if I could have found some sort of like 30 day program to do that, but it didn't work that way. And so I really feel like I kind of built up to, um, the privilege of, of having something like this, um, release some things for me that maybe I hadn't myself. So mm -hmm. if I, that all sounds a little bit too crazy for some people, I, you know, I apologize, but I do sort of take, they take the position that there are a lot of different things at play when I had these breakthroughs and, and wearing this was just, you know, it happened to be on me at the same time. So take that for what yeah. it's worth. Yeah. That's a good reminder. I mean, hell yeah. We all wish there was like a quick 30 day that just solves all your problems and reconnects your body and mind and removes any limiting beliefs you have about your body. But that work does take time and, and it's always worth it because you and I have both gone through that on our journeys and now we are at this place where you're right. This is like a privilege. We can just fuck around with this thing. And yes. it's like, ah, cool. Okay. And now I can go back to living my life. <laughs> exactly. Like we can sit and laugh about how it's telling us that we're going to gain weight because we ate an apple at that time. Like that's yeah. ridiculous, but we get to do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it was so good to catch up with you, Katie. Thank it was you. so good to see your face and talk with you about this. Cause this is the first time like you and I have really like gone through both of our experiences too. So yeah. it was really, this was so fun. So thank you for your time. Um, thank you for sharing. And where can people find you if they want to connect with you or ask you questions? So I'm mostly just on Instagram at Katie Crocus. Uh, I mean, other than that, I'm not too active anywhere else. I've played with TikTok, but oh my God, I hate it. Like, Oh it's dude, you're like my only friend on TikTok now. <laughs> I'm also new to it. <laughs> And so every time I open the app, I'm like, oh, there's Katie again. It's just like Katie, Katie, Katie. I'm like, this is great. It's just me and Katie on TikTok. Oh, I'm sorry for you that I'm the only thing you're seeing. But it, uh, you I know, like it. I like it. <laughs> well, you're, I mean, I, I got to say, I'm addicted to your podcast to the point that I listen to them twice sometimes. They're so good. Aww. So I think you're so wise to have this on on YouTube, on on the certainly all the, the um, podcast platforms. And I just... I'm always in awe of everything you do. And I can't wait to see what you have coming down the pike. It's always oh, amazing. Right back at you. I can't oh. wait for your next recipe book. I'll be patiently waiting. Oh, God, God. <laughs> it's going to be a little while, but I'll keep you yeah, posted. Okay, whenever you're ready. <laughs> well, thanks again. And thank you everyone for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it to your story. Leave the review, uh, leave the podcast a review. And feel free to reach out to us. If you have follow-up questions, something specific that we didn't answer, um, let us know. We're both super open, obviously. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk to you next week. Bye.